I'm Shibu J, and welcome to Brain Food at the theaters. It's just a couple hours before I go and see uh, Star Trek Into Darkness, and when I'm done, I'll have a review for you. It's, this one is going to be filled with spoilers and everything, I, uh, because from everything that I've heard so far about it, it I really don't think you're going to miss out much on if I tell you the spoilers. Still, I will say, from this point on, if you don't want to be spoiled, stop watching the review, go out and see the movie, and then come back, because uh, I think I'm going to have a fair amount of thoughts about this movie. Alright, I'll see you guys in a couple hours. <laughs> spoilers. I will say this again. There's going to be spoilers. Let's begin, shall we? I have never seen a more shallow, pandering remake ever in my life than I have with Star Trek In the Darkness. It's... You know, there was an interview with J.J. Uh, Abrams where he talked about uh, talked with John Stewart on The Daily Show about how he didn't like Star Trek. He didn't get it. It was too filled with philosophy. Well, a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of discussion was put into this movie about morality, revenge, vengeance, uh, doing what's right. It gets tossed out. Uh, fairly quickly in this movie. As I said, there are major spoilers. I will give you one last chance to turn off the video or walk out that door. First, okay, I will say some good things, some good things. I do like the new design of this Enterprise. I really do like it. It looks, it looks lovely. I, I really do. Uh, there's even a nice inside shot of the uh, engine room where it looks like this big, complicated, massive power engine. It, I mean, I, I honestly think I honestly think it really should look like that. I mean, you got that. You sort of get that sense with the other stuff: uh, uh, TNG, Voyager, Deep Space Nine. Um, even Enterprise did it to a certain degree, that this is something massive that powers the ship and 
puts it through space at faster than light speeds. It's all very good. The chemistry between the crew, uh, the character actors, Zachary Quinto and Chris Pine, Joel, uh, Zoe Saldana, uh, everyone, it's good. Uh, when they make an attempt at humor, it's not forced. It's actually quite funny. I mean, uh, one commenter even said that when he was watching uh, Simon Pegg as... as uh, uh, as uh, Scotty, he figured he could almost imagine James Doohan looking down, smiling, "Had a boy, laddie." You know, he's really, really good. He... And I love the visuals, the visuals of the planets uh, of Kronos, because we do go to the Klingon homeworld, which is very, very barren. Uh, yeah, I know it takes place on a barren part, but and, and in space, I. If you could just make a ride where I could sit in a chair, a like nice futuristic captain's chair, and you just have the space, like, like, like what they show in the film, I would go there again and again and again, because it looks gorgeous. Uh, the sound effects is really nice, they, and keeping it up. I mean, uh, uh, you even get nice shots of the communicators, and and it's... They're almost kind of, they're retro now, because when cell phones came out, they flip open just like they did on Star Trek, and now they you know they 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 look like this. So it's it's future retro now. It's kind of funny. There are cat girls. I am not kidding you. Um, I'll put the picture up here. The, here so that you can see, but J.J. Abrams or someone on the design department or someone in the script, whoever was responsible, brought in the cat girls that was in the Star Trek animated series. They're there. They're nice. And there's actually one crew member, um, for some reason Bridge Bunny com pops to mind. I'm not sure where that term comes from. She doesn't get a name, sadly. But she is this curvaceous, black, bald woman, and she looks fantastic. And it's really, it was actually really great to see that, you know. And like, not everyone is, you know, super thin and slim and, and, and everything else. We all have our own set weight. So it was really good to see her. Um, uh, what else good was there? Uh, I might mention some other good things, but I, if I stumble across it. But I think that's about it. Cat Girls, sound designs, engine looks great, Enterprise looks lovely, she's a lovely, lovely ship. And the chemistry amongst all the characters, it's really good. It's wonderful, it's funny, it makes you laugh. And, and most of the time, as, uh, uh, more than once, the feel of the humor of the movie honestly made me think of an Iron of uh, Iron Man 3 or any good Marvel movie. Like, one of the weakest Marvel movies, it's kind of a, from what I hear, Iron Man 2 kind of fell more, but they said even the weakest such as Thor, it makes you laugh. You, you know, you, you have a good time. And, but it, the humor wasn't enough to make up for this. This is, like I said, one of the most shallow, pandering, M movie remakes I've ever seen. This is Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. I'm not kidding you on that. Um, Benedict Cumberbatch or Benedict, Benedict Q. Cumberbatch as uh, he's Khan. It even says, I'm Khan. Like he fucking freaking just says, Khan. Like, what the hell are you doing, Sherlock? Stop it. You're not even that good a Sherlock. The guy from Elementary is a much better Sherlock. And and Lucy Lou's a really good Watson. This is fantastic. They are great. I'm thinking about other stuff that I would really rather be watching than this movie. I'm sorry, I gotta keep it quiet. It means it's finals now. I love my fellow roommates are doing calculus and everything. I mean, just fuck this. Oh my god, this movie. I, this movie was... It rips off Khan, the Wrath of Khan so many times, but it has none of the heart. It really has none of the heart. It tries to give it heart, but it doesn't earn it. 
I've never been in a movie where so many dramatic scenes had so much unintentional laughter. Literally, the whole theater, uh, uh, people even my age, even a bit younger, who maybe have seen the older films, just laughing their butts off at everything there. Just, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was laughing at it. So as I said, yeah, he's con and just like, he's, he wants his crew back. And just uh, Marcus, this big ass admiral who, admiral who wants a big fight. And there's a little in, nice little Easter egg you actually see in his office after, after Christopher Pike dies. Yes, they kill off Christopher Pike. Bruce Greenwood, easily one of the great actors in this film, uh, who I honestly wish they had kept around. I mean, you didn't have to really follow everything in Star Trek. You didn't. But he's dead. Um, he gets killed by Khan. Uh, Khan. 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 Uh, anyhow, he gets killed by Khan and Kirk goes into a new crazy anger revenge mode. Uh, this is after Captain Kirk does some really stupid shit in which he and his crew stop, they stop a volcano from detonate, erupting and destroying this civilization. And it's a white painted yellow hair, yellow dress, yellow skirt, no, yellow shorts wearing, spear throwing, pre-will uh, civilization. And they saved the planet and everything. Because of that, Spot makes the official report. And of course, like, oh, Jim. Uh, oh you, you, Spock. Uh, sorry, Captain. I said we had to take responsibility. And anyhow, so Kirk gets demoted. Um, and then Khan begins his reign of attack. And, um, oh, Jesus Christ. So much. Okay, so that happens. And then Kirk's like, hey, uh, Scotty finds out, hey, use this teleporter to get away in this other, in the second attack that he makes in which he kills off Christopher Pike. Fuck. Why, why would you get rid of Bruce Greenwood like that? Come on. He was so good. Uh, anyhow, he goes, and Scotty finds out where he's went. He went to Kronos to clean out Homeworld. And, and Kirk's like, hey, I found him. Give me this, uh, you know, give me my shit back, give me the Enterprise back. So any consequence he, 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 he undergoes, just whoosh, gone, gone. Just Why would you even have that friggin' build-up? Why would you even have that friggin' build-up? <sighs> and he's like, no, I gotta have Spock back with me. Yeah, sure thing, Spock's back with me. Okay, fine, whatever. Uh, and so they're off to Kronos. And Enterprise breaks down. Uh, because Scott, uh, because they're transporting full-time torpedoes, and these full-time tor at this point, full-time torpedoes are like these. They don't never had them before. There's like advanced weaponry, like long range, fire and forget type stuff. It's like they're the nuclear weapons of a new trick here. And Kirk's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna goddamn use them." And Spock's like, "Dude, no, this is." This is bad. This is immoral. He committed a crime. We bring this guy back, if possible. But we make sure we try to get him back first. Uh, and and they finally bring in the Klingons. And the Klingon ships look really ugly. It's like they've been trans Michael Bay formed um, in a way. It's just really ugly. And Benedict Cumberbatch he shows up and he kicks everyone's ass and. I got his portrayal of Khan is just, he talks about, okay, because of the events of the first film, Admiral Marcus is like, well, fuck, we gotta prepare for everything, you know, more military, more military, fight, 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 kill, kill, kill. And he's like, hmm, holy shit, look at these superhumans from the past. Hey, Khan, wake up, give me a hand here. Okay, okay. Oh, uh, you're not getting other people. What? Kill crazy. And like that and so uh, I lost my train of thought I need more whiskey <sighs> oh god the Canadian club <sighs> so um he's no Ricardo Montalban when you got a sense of con like Yes, there was that superior sense, and Ricardo Montalban, I mean, he made, uh, Gene Rodberry made him as Indian, 
and he painted him as Indian. I mean, there's even a where he's painted a picture of himself in the original series, Spacey, and he's you know he's got a turban on. He's Indian, so whitewashing, not good. Especially, I mean, this is really bad in a series where where I mean, Gene Roddenberry had the fight like fucking hell. They get uh, they get Nichelle Nichols, who I met, who is a gorgeous, lovely woman. She is oh my god, she, she's got a voice like an angel, and and then here and yes, I know person of color as the bad guy, but if you really think about it, you know he, he had some clout behind him. Uh, uh, Khan did, as portrayed by Ricardo Montalbant. Uh, after all, excuse me, there was the genetics wars. I mean, bad time on Earth, and then they made these people, these superhumans, you know, clean up our mess, clean up our mess, clean up our shit. And there was some, you know, yeah, there's some real world history about how people have taken other people, mainly white people, have taken people of color, and said, clean up our shit. I mean, hell, I mean, I'm in Canada, there's the U.S. right below us. We both have really ugly histories about where we t took people of color to make our countries. And so you you got that about that. But he was also, he was a poet. He was an artist. He, he was, and, and he was strong, and he was fierce, and he was loyal to his people. You, you didn't like what he was going to do on the Enterprise and take over the Enterprise and everything. And, but... He was this multifaceted figure, and Benedict Cumberbatch. No, you're not Khan. He's not Khan. Benedict is not Khan. He's not. He's not. He's not. He just is. He always has a fucking trench coat too. Seriously, he picks up a trench coat. I mean, at, at the end, he crashes his dreadnought into her. Like, uh, blah, blah, uh, I can get ready, run away from Spock. Blah, blah. Oh, trench coat. Like, what the hell? So, there's that part there. Whitewashing. No, 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 no. Don't. No, 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 no. So, you have that. And you do have Kirk kind of, I mean, like, there's all this ugly stuff. And I could sort of see maybe the potential of it, but it basically comes down to the Wrath of Khan, Star Trek II. There's even a scene where the Enterprise is literally falling into Earth's orbit. And they got no control, you know, everything's going crazy. And we all know what happens in the second movie, which was that Spock sacrificed himself, sa sacrificed himself in order to get the warp core back online so that they could get the hell out of the nebula. And this time is Kirk. Yes, that's right. Kirk dies. Well, he's mostly dead. You see, there's different kinds of dead. There's dead dead, mostly dead, kind of dead, and sort of dead. Uh, he wasn't dead dead, he was sort of dead. Those who get that reference, I love you. Now, anyhow... Uh, Anyhow, Admiral Marcus, he got Khan out to help make all this super weaponry for the Federation because it's at a point where there's going to be some fighting with the Klingons, and damn soon. And it's, I mean, it even helps make this super dreadnought. This thing is like two to three, time, three times the size of the Enterprise, and it rips the absolute shit out of it. I mean, it, it was a bit painful to watch. You know, I, I, I think it was a bad sign that I cared more about an inanimate, well, okay, a ship more than I did the rest of the movie. Uh, so, sorry, my thoughts are just going over the place. The whiskey is kicking in. So, when they ripped off that scene, Kirk literally, like, threw it a glass. He did that whole, like, scene like this. And... It's Spock that goes, God! And the theater erupted in laughter. Whatever emotional 
intensity or drama they were trying for in that scene, they, they fucked it up. Everyone just laughed their asses off. Just... Ugh. And Khan's blood is apparently also the same as Wolverine's, because that's part of what makes him so strong, because he has these incredible regenerative powers. Yes, he has Wolverine's healing factor. And just not the claws. Right. Uh, no, but and so because it, I'm sorry, look, it just doesn't work. Look, by the time we actually got to see Sp Spock and Kirk have that really emotional scene in the engine room near the end of the Wrath of Khan, this was after years and years of friendship, getting to know each other, seeing each other ups and downs like you would not believe. So you'd believe that. I mean, it came across even if you were a casual fan. You know, that part where they're sending Spock's body off to Genesis and Kirk is saying his eulogy. Of all the, of all the, of all the people I've ever, of all the souls I've met in my life, his was the most, and, you know, there's just a moment where he's just, you literally see him physically swallow down the emotion because he's the captain. He's got to st stay in control of everything at that moment. Human. They're trying here so much, except the roles are reversed. And it's not working. It's really, really not. It's just terribly done, like you wouldn't believe. So when you get, see Spock going, gone. It was laughable. So, anyhow, Admiral Marcus shows up in this big dreadnought thing because their idea was that they were going to shoot Khan. They gave Kirk, Captain Kirk, these torpedoes and he was going to freaking shoot them all at Khan on Kronos and unintentionally start a war. Kirk has a change of heart. Most likely thanks to, you know, Scotty resigning his post and, um, and Spock being, literally being a little, the angel, his conscience, his active conscience. And so he says, okay, I'm going to capture him. And he, ca he captures Khan, who Khan just actually just gives up after killing literally two or three birds of prey and all the Klingons on board. That's how freaking tough Khan is. He, he, he's no Ricardo Montalban. He, he, sorry, he's not Khan. Uh, Benadurp, anyhow, that's what I'm going to call him. Benadurp, Super Benadurp. Super Benadurp just gives up because in those torpedoes that they gave him are actually all, the, all of his crew, you know, 72 people. And, uh, and he snuck them on there. Admiral Marcus doesn't know. Admiral Marcus shows up in this dreadnought. And this is like this big... It literally looks like, looks like the USS Black Ops. That's the only way I could describe it. This is a massive thing built for war. And it tears Enterprises to pieces on the way back to Earth. Uh, it literally catches up to them and, and blows them up. It blows up, nearly blows the whole thing apart. And so Kirk has to help get Khan uh, to help him get onto the bridge and everything. And, I betrayed you, Kirk. No, I betrayed you, Khan. Blah, 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 blah. Anyhow, Khan takes position. Uh, it's, which leads to, you know, the warp core failure and Kirk sacrificing his life. Anyhow, I know I'm over the place, but this is just shallow. It, Khan crashes, or Benadurp, Super Benador crashes, uh, crashes the Super Dreadnought on the Earth, takes out the rock. No, not Dwayne Johnson. I'm actually talking about the island because it's, you know, Starfleet headquarters in San Francisco. Crashes a ship there. Um, the Enterprise is just barely holding together. Spock is enraged. He gets beamed down, and there's like this intense foot chase between him and Super Benadorp. And this big fight on all these, on these ships, that moving ships. And Spock is just barely able to hold his own against Super Benadurp. And then Uhura calls down and zaps his fucking ass with about two dozen or so phaser stunts. Because the thing is, because Super Benadurp has Wolverine's healing factor, his blood can revive Kirk, uh, who was put into a stasis. 
They find this out because Bones took some of Super Benadar's blood, put it into a dead Tribble, and it came back alive. Uh, it, where the fuck did he even get the Tribble? I don't even remember the Tribble from the first movie. There was actually this really fun fanfic I read where Doctor Who, uh, uh, Tenth Doctor, Doctor Who fanfic I read, I, I, I think I still got it archived on my live journal somewhere, where Doctor Who gets, um, gets Doctor Martha Jones to go aboard the new Who, the new Trek Enterprise as a doctor's assistant in order to find and capture a Tribble, and in exchange, he, she gives it to Spock to give to Nyota, uh, to give to Nyota as a, you know, gift, because they're fighting. So anyhow, Nyota zaps his ass, they bring it, uh, and that's another thing. They do almost nothing with Uhura. Like, I, I like Zoe Soldat, Soldat, fuck, I like Zoe. I'm sorry, I'm drunk, I'm starting to get drunk, this movie is just bad. But they do nothing with her. They utterly underutilize her. Uh, at one point, when they go down to Kronos, they take this shuttle they had confiscated from an earlier mission. They pretend to be smugglers. And and so the Klingons force them to land. And, and Uhura's like, hey, you brought me along because I know Klingon. I'll handle this. And she goes out, and honestly, it almost looks like she's about to handle it. And then she... She doesn't, and Super Benedict saves them all. And it's like, what? She only ever gets to really save Spock just just once. The nice thing is they actually keep Spock and Uhura together, which, but again, they don't do much with her. It, this movie almost seems to be about Kirk and Spock, Super Bros. So anyhow, uh, they get uh, they get. Super Benedict back. They get his blood into Kirk. Kirk's fine. He's back on the bridge, uh, the Enterprise, and the movie ends with them taking off under five-year, five-year exploration journey into deep space. And thus ended with one of the. It's. It's a complete and utter waste. This was a complete and utter waste. Of potential. You said you wanted, when you did this thing, you wanted to do it, uh, bring in new fans. Well, I mean, at least that's what they wanted to do. You know, I mean, there's a lot of history behind it. And the way they did it in the first Star Trek movie was a good way. Uh, because that way you have, you know, the old fans and then the new fans. You know, that way, it was a way of saying, hey, we're bringing in new fans. But we love you old fans. The old universe is still alive and intact. It's okay. And, you know, that shows some nice, nice respect, which is rare from a big uh, movie company these days. But then you go and do something like this movie, and you try to give it the kind of gravitas that the original movie, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, had, and it falls so flat on its face, it's, it's funny. I mean, it's funny. Like, you feel bad for laughing, but you laugh nonetheless. Heck, at one point in this movie, there was a ripoff of a short pack strip. Now, a uh, short pack is a really good uh, web comic. It's really good for for dissecting stuff like fans getting angry that they cast Johnny Storm uh, as a black man. Uh, they got a black man to portray him, and there, he made a strip shortly after the new Trek came out, in which you know, they talked about. Old Spock's talking to Kirk, and he's saying, okay, when you get to this, do this. Can you get this, do this. Get that and that. And Kirk's like, wait, shouldn't we figure this stuff out on our own? Old Spock looks at him, glares on him, and young Kirk's like, fine, what else? And at one point, during the standoff between the Super Dreadnought uh, and being infiltrated by Khan, uh, Scotty, and Kirk... Spock calls New Vulcan. Uh, I'm assuming they found a planet. Eh. Like there's a game that says the uh, there's a game set in between where they said they you know they made a planet. But anyhow, New Spock activates his cheat code. He gets his game genie out, and again 
points to you if you know what a Game Genie is. Gets out his Game Genie, punches in the code for knowledge, and contacts old Spock, Leonard Nimoy. Nice, fairly lengthy cameo. And he asks him, so why do you know, know anything about a guy named Khan? And, and old Spock's like, Ooh. Like literally, uh, his eyes, he just widened his eyes a little bit, and there's like, oh, fuck me. So much, there's so much of that feeling in his eyes, you know. Uh, and that's how he learns they learn more about it. It's not like they actually did any act of digging. They just entered a cheat code. Uh, this is so shallow. It looks pretty, but there's no really emotional depth. There's maybe one really good scene where Spock and Uhura are talking about uh, are talking about Spock nearly dying in the volcano. Um, because at that point, near the beginning of the film, the Enterprise is at the bottom of an ocean. I don't know why it's at the bottom of an ocean, if only for to give it a really cool scene of the Enterprise rising up out of the ocean and ripping off. This movie ripped itself off from the first New Trek movie two or three times. We see the Enterprise rise up through water and then rise up through clouds, just like it rolls up out of the rings of Jupiter in the first movie. But anyhow, Spock's, eh, her is like, you know, it's like you don't care about what happens to those of us left behind if you were to die. Because Spock was saying, prime directive, you cannot expose the natives to this, uh, to any kind of technology. Don't even let us see them, see us, or because, because you'd royally fuck them up. That's the prime directive. So I got to die in order to preserve that. Kirk's like, no, and takes off in the Enterprise and saves Spock from, you know, detonating, uh, you know, an erupting volcano, as well as a cold fusion device that they set into it, which they weren't really supposed to do. But, and there's this really good scene. It's one of the few genuine good, heartfelt moments where Spock is, where you get, you. It's more the depth of frustration, of effort, between him and her hura, and I'm glad they did that. Uh, because there's some talk because they had Carol Marcus. Yes, that's right, Kirk's wife. She she pops up as this and as the daughter of Admiral Marcus. Anyhow. Uh, and he explains, you know, I care, but not in the way that you do. And I felt such, I, I can't even really explain it. The movies uh, would be, you. I don't want to tell you to spend your money to see this movie just for that scene, but that scene alone, Zachary Quinto is fucking amazing in it. He's really, really good. The rest of the movie, not so much. Again, the humor, when they play it up for laughs, it's good. But it's all about action. It's all about fighting. You know, I mean, there's no... There's nothing about diplomacy or seeking out new life. It's just a complete shallow ripoff of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. That's all this is. And... It's not worth it. Maybe wait for the movie to come out on DVD so you could... Oh, Jesus, are there even any video stores you rent from? Okay, wait for it to come out on Netflix or something. Or wait for someone else dumb enough to buy the DVD or Blu-ray and then watch it. Because it's not worth it. This was really, really weak. This was really, really bad. They talk about the un the odd number classic Trek movies as being the worst ones. Two, four, and six are great. One, three, and five are bad. I've never seen all of one. I've seen three and five. I'd say this movie is worse than three. That's right. I went there. This movie is worse than Star Trek III The Search for Spock. And I actually like Star Trek III The Search for Spock. I really do. It, it's, it's not worth seeing in the theater. It's not. The vid is, uh, as someone else once said, actually this was, um, uh, shoot, I don't want to use the quote. I don't want to. It, 
I'll use one of my own. It's like eating a bunch of junk food. You get a sugar rush, it's delicious, you love it, it's yummy, it's you know, a whole nom, 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 nom. And then later on you're regret, you're regretting it because you had all that sugar, you had all that fat, you gained about two or three pounds, you feel dumb from the sugar crash and you wish you had never done it in the first place. Plus this whitewashing did not really help. Seriously, did they had to get super Benadirt there? Ugh. Well, that's all I got left to say about this movie. Don't see it. I'm Triple J, and that's all I got left to say. Take care.